Hello Matrix and welcome to the last of 10 videos for Grade 12 Functions brought to you by the Answer Series. This 10th video looks at two exam questions. I've given you a hyperbola and asked you various questions. So what I want you to do is I want you to pause the video, I want you to try this question and then we'll do it together. Question 1.1 asks you for the equations of the asymptotes of the inverse. So what you've got to do is take the original, the asymptotes are y equals minus 2 and x equals 1. Now remember what happens with an inverse, the x and the y values swap around. So if the asymptote was y equals minus 2, then in the inverse, the asymptote will be x equals minus 2. In f of x, there was my other asymptote at x equals 1. So in the inverse, the asymptote will be at y equals 1. Question 1.2 asks you to determine the equation of the axis of symmetry that does not cut the hyperbola. So I've drawn it in there. Remember the gradient of that line is minus 1. It passes through the point 1 minus 2. So I substitute 1 minus 2 and I get the equation of my axis of symmetry. In 1.3, I ask you to determine the equation of f if it is rotated 90 degrees anti-clockwise about the origin. So what I get is as follows. This asymptote, y equals minus 2. If I go from the origin to the asymptote and rotate 90 degrees anti-clockwise, it ends up there. So that asymptote is x equals 2, which means in my fraction, I divide by x minus 2. My other asymptote is at x equals 1. If I go from the origin to it and rotate 90 degrees anti-clockwise, it ends up there at y equals 1, which means I've got a plus 1 on the end. What happens to my hyperbola when I rotate at 90 degrees? Well, it swaps quadrants. So my a value was 4. What is my new a value now? It's minus 4. In 1.4, I give you the hyperbola, but this time I have a plus p on the end. Now my graph is not moving sideways at all. That hasn't changed. All it's doing is moving up or down. And I ask you for what values of p will g of x have a positive root? Okay, so this is now a new graph, but I'm taking this graph and I'm sliding it up or down. My asymptote is there. I have a positive x-intercept. If I slide my asymptote down anywhere, I will always still get a positive x-intercept. So if I slide my graph down from where it is at the moment, I will get a positive x-intercept. If I slide it up, as long as I don't go to the x-axis or above, I will still get a positive x-intercept. So as I slide this up, I'll still get a positive x-intercept as long as this asymptote doesn't go to the x-axis. So as long as my asymptote is anything below the x-axis, I will get a positive root. So p could be less than zero. Now, what about this arm? Well, I could take this arm and I can slide it up. And if I slide it up so that it goes just beyond the origin, I will get a positive x-intercept. So what happens is as follows. My y-intercept must go up just beyond the origin. In other words, it's got to go just more than 6, which means that my asymptote is also going to be sliding just more than 6. At the moment my asymptote is y equals minus 2. If I slide it 6 up, it becomes y equals 4. So as long as my p-value is above 4, I will cut at a positive x-intercept. 
1.5 asks you for the area of triangle ABC. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a trapezium and I'm going to subtract these two triangles. And if I take the trapezium and subtract those two triangles, I will get the area of triangle ABC, which is what I was asked. So let's have a look. DB is two units long. DA is two. AE is two. And EC is one. Now the formula for the area of a trapezium is half the sum of the parallel sides times the height between them. So the trapezium, it's half 2 plus 1 times by 4. So there's my trapezium. This triangle, half base times height, there's the area. And this triangle, again, half base times height. And if I work that out, I get the area to be 3 units squared. Now, example number two is another problem-solving question. And as I said to you in the previous video, problem-solving questions, you need to try. Don't be scared of them. Try them. See what you can do with it. So what I want you to do is I want you to pause the video. I want you to try this example, and then we'll do it together. All right. They've given me consecutive terms of a geometric sequence. So that means that E divided by D is the same as F divided by E because a geometric sequence has a constant ratio. Cross multiply and take it all to one side and I get that E squared minus DF is equal to zero. Now if I work with delta, delta is B squared minus 4AC. So in this example, delta is E squared minus 4DF. I split the minus 4DF into minus DF minus 3DF. Why have I done that? Well, I've done it because E squared minus DF I know is zero. So delta is just equal to minus 3DF. Now you know that D is positive and F is positive, which means that minus 3DF is negative. And if delta is negative, I have no x-intercepts, which means my entire parabola is going to be above the x-axis because d is positive, so the arms are going up. My axis of symmetry is x equals minus b over 2a. So in this example, it's x equals minus e over 2d. d is positive, e is positive, which means my axis of symmetry is negative. So I've got a parabola whose arms go up, axis of symmetry is negative, and it never cuts the x-axis. So there's my parabola. You should now feel more confident with answering exam questions. Thank you for watching this video. Check out the video description below for practice questions from our study guides. If you found this video useful, give it a like and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any new episodes. Follow us on Instagram or Facebook to stay on top of the latest TAS news and launches. So that's it for now from The Answer Series, your key to exam success.